that was funny. We had, a, we had a stunt double for the butt. There was like a chanting bum in there. Oh, really? Hootie Tooty Disco Cutie. There's a quick shot where Janet like pulls her ass apart. And <laughs> <laughs> it was the last shot we did that day. There was this woman who was like waiting around all day and I saw her at lunch and eventually I said to someone, I said, who's, your, who's, who's she? And said, oh, that's some... Um, that's the stunt double, double for Janet's anus. And then she sort of like went in there. I didn't really have the courage to say hello to her because I felt so kind of, I felt so awkward about the fact that that's what she was doing. But then she sort of went in for 30 seconds, like pulled her ass apart, then just went off and said, oh, thanks everyone. That's the most fun I've ever had at work. <laughs> What's her work normally? I have no idea. Yeah. Someone said to me they thought she was a prostitute. <laughs> I yeah, most know. people. But I didn't even say goodbye. To her. Yeah. I didn't say one word. To her. I'm she did not probably made it even better. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi everybody. I'm Mark Chaffardini. That's Brian Kluger. We're here with Jim Hosking and David White to talk about the enchanting Beverly Loveland. No, wait, an enchanting. How do you say it? An yeah. evening with Beverly Loveland. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Two words. Luckily, two words. <laughs> so we're here at the 2018 Fantastic Fest with Mr. Hosking and Mr. Wyke. Uh, what a fun movie. Um, All-star cast. How do you go from G for Grandpa to The Greasy Strangler to this really absurd but charming romantic comedy? Um, well, I think it's, you know, trying to have a career. Really. <laughs> <laughs> just got right. <laughs> no, um, yeah. No, there's no... Uh, I don't have any kind of strategy or logic to anything, but it's just like, um, you know, each each film is kind of like, it's just got a different, you just go in with a different headset kind of thing, and it's a bit like you do, I suppose like G for Grandad is kind of quite similar to Greasy in a way, and then Laughlin, different writer with me, and just totally different objective. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's, I mean, obviously I like, seeing huge dongs swinging around the screen as much as anyone. <laughs> they don't have to be in every film that I do. Although G for Grandad had a man with balls and no dong. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I feel I've kind of covered that now. I'm Cover that region. Yeah, I've covered that region, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you got to go around back. I'm moving around the back. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so what comes first? Is it is it the characters? Is it the... the you just start with the title that's esoteric and then build the story around that? It's or? definitely not... The, well, actually, some things it can be... Uh, some things it can be the title, yeah. But with Laughlin, um, no, it started with it started with uh, some characters. David written a scene uh, with the guys who are in the coffee shop, Shane and Carl and Tyrone, and he sent me this scene. And then I uh, said, "If there's anything it's funny, everyone's <laughs> just <isn't> funny. <laughs> he said, he said, if you can think of anything to go on from this, you know, and I." wrote some stuff and it just kind of, uh, you know, for us it's definitely about the characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. about, we're not, I mean, I'm not bothered about plot, plot. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go in and have a, some kind of ideological message that I'm trying to sort of like get across to people. It's really about, about emotion and characters and humanity, even if it's some eccentric version of that, but you know, it's what we're feeling. And then we just go with that trusting, that if we follow our guts and our instinct, then we're going to do something that we like, I think. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's, um, I think you guys are some of the most creative, if not the most creative, and original voices in film today. What's that process taking, you know, these characters that it's like a love story, it's kind of simple at heart, but you add all of these, you know, not just these very creative choices to it. How is the process like when you take on a project like that? Well, <clears throat> to me I, uh, I suppose I like the way that I approach things is I just feel like whenever there's like any element within it I'm trying to make what I feel is like the interesting version of that you know and so whether that's like whether that's like someone's clothes or their dance or you know some dialogue or whatever it might be it's like I'm just try, I try and focus on the details I mean that's just like a natural thing and so then um, it's and also just wanting to be distinctive I don't understand why people want to make films that are like other 
films that have been made. I just don't, it just doesn't hold any interest to me. So like I'm trying to express myself in a way that feels like it could only come from me. Although obviously it also comes from him, but you know, that's my part within it. And I suppose what's good about working with someone else or writing with someone else is that, you know, there's elements that go into the story that just wouldn't exist if I had done it on my own. So like Dave, Dave comes from a very different place to me, you know, like when we first, I know I'm talking all the time, you will get a chance. No, no, I'm just, <laughs> but when we, I'm following that little guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely more interesting than anything I've said. Um, but you know, when we first met, he was, he was like going on about how he thought Risky Business was a perfect film, you know, and I mean, to me, that was like one, of, one of the biggest red flags I've ever come across. Well, I, actually, to be honest, I hadn't seen it. <laughs> but you know, like to me, no, I'm kind of joking about it, but I mean, it's... I mean, there are other... Uh, I like, mean, we, we grew up in different places, our influences are completely different, but then also, actually, you love, like, Withnail and I, or you love... All, yeah. You love Harold and Maud, or, you know, there's a lot there's of There's more commonality than there is yeah. disagreement. I mean, that yeah. the, the risky business thing is like, I'm interesting that you brought that up. No, but, but I just me, mean that that's about... Yeah, like, it is a very American sort of moment in history of film and, and characters. And to me, when, I don't know, when I brought that up, it was like, oh, this film has... And it's also studied as, like, the script and the thing. Of, yeah, like, I'm just saying like, it's like bringing different, yeah. different things to it, you know. And I, I love it. I think it's so good. And I also love you touched on this a little bit, but um, you said you film the movie in California, but the sets and everything, and you know where you filmed, it almost feels like a fantasy, almost Wes Anderson type feel. Like it's not in the U.S. It's not in California. Can you elaborate how y'all got you know all of that? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we ended up there because the production designer, Jason Kisbade, had found the hotel mm -hmm. there, or it's called the Eureka Inn, which is like a, you know, you see it in the film, but it's kind of like a pretty low rent version of the Overlook Hotel, I suppose, run by a Chinese <laughs> man in Northern California. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as like the styling of it, I mean, uh, like I, I made the Greasy Strangle, which was like, uh, you know, to me that was kind of like I was trying to almost make something that was kind of like a cartoon in a funny way, you know, and quite like a, like a children's film where the subject matter had just got completely fucked up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with this film, I just wanted every element to kind of be possible, but it's like you know you create another world with the choices that you make and with the you know, the stuff that you don't put into a film. So well, there's no, yeah, there's not really much kind of modern stuff in there. And the cars that are chosen are sort of clapped out old bangers from the, you know, 80s. And uh, yeah, and I suppose the characters are kind of styled quite specifically and quite hard. But um, I mean, as far as like Wes Anderson, uh, uh, yeah, not really an influence. Wow. Also, what was <laughs> ironic was in the script, we were trying to set the thing and we were trying to make it in you know the sort of non just this kind of area we just set it randomly in i think it said in oregon somewhere and so by the time we got around to looking for the locations it was really about how do you find this main hotel and what was ironic was that it actually was two hours south of the oregon border you know it ended up being very similar to that you know that world, and we were entertained. Yeah, but that it almost was shot it. upstate at one point. Um, so it was just interesting that it ended up kind of near. Well, it was almost shot in upstate New York, but then yeah. the shoot got pushed because Aubrey was making a pilot. But um, yeah, that so that would have been completely different. That would have been like in the freezing cold, like yeah, it would have been a very snow and ice everywhere, and everybody wearing big bear coats. I mean, it could have been quite interesting. It was very cold up there, though. Too, we wore more yes. clothing indoors than outdoors. Wow. Well, yeah, it. it was freezing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I like how you used the the term cartoony to describe this because the one well, actually, that was more for the strangler than this. Oh, okay. One. Yeah, but I but I still felt something like Emil Hirsch. He emoted a lot more than he should have, and even to the point where he thought that putting a blonde wig on would make, you know, like Superman takes on the glasses and takes them off, nobody recognizes him. <laughs> so, what was the back and forth between the two of you going, okay, well, I think Craig Robinson should be uh, Beverly, 
and I think um, Colin should be um, Jermaine Clements. How did you decide on who you wanted, and what was the, the dual responsibilities writing? Um, yeah, I mean, we definitely talked a lot about casting, um, casting choices. Uh, it was, I mean, so, some roles kind of just because it's 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 a lot more straightforward, you know. So like for Beverly, it was my, it was it was obvious I think that we wanted Craig like from the get go, mm -hmm. uh, and then we had a meal kind of in our heads for Jermaine Clement's character actually to play Colin, and then we kind of switched that, and he he became Shane and. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you, you know, it's, uh, I mean, and then there are other characters where it's like it's much harder. So for Rodney, I guess we we were originally thinking of this guy who was possibly German, but you know, looked like Michael McDonald and had a, it, like you know. Then we were sort of quite obsessed with with George Lucas and and him having sort of no 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 chin or like going into his neck, and he had to look like that and. You know, it was quite a circuitous route to sort of like get to Matt Berry, but um, I don't know. Casting is a very strange thing. It's like it, when you when you think about casting a movie before you've made a movie, it feels like it'll be oh, it'll be the most uh, fun, liberating, exciting uh, process where I can just create this world that I've always dreamt of, and it'll be so you know tight to my original idea. And when it comes to actually doing it in reality, there's so many sort of pragmatics about like people's availability and and then even just like being able to like when it when it's going to happen and then you're thinking about yeah. oh, god will they all go together is this person going to work with this person and you know often it's just like offers to people and you don't have them read for the part you you, you have like the smaller characters read for the part you know mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of just going on on kind of faith isn't there yeah, yeah but the good thing about this one was that pretty much every first choice yeah. actor they wanted to do it, it. Nice. yeah so fortunate yeah, this was so much fun. hey look coffee came <laughs> but you guys i, I want to say that it feels like the, this is probably the front runner for the funniest movie i've seen this year just unexpected humor just warm characters and just it all kind of coalesced it's this. the only comedy that's been made in 2018 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're at the top of the list. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that, that thanks a lot. That's, no, that's thanks really good to hear yeah. that. Well, Honestly, it's we think it's it, funny. It, well, it's, we it's like feel it. good. Yeah. Um, also, the uh, the music of the film is just so iconic, and just like Greasy Strangler, you know, I own the soundtrack to that, and it just plays so well, just sitting around in a day. But this one, how did you get this soundtrack going? And were you very heavily involved in the music creation for it? Well, I'm very heavily involved in um, exceptionally long conversations with Andy Hung, who makes the music, and he made the music for Greasy Strangler. Right? So we'll have like a two-hour Skype, and then the next morning I'll get like a five-word email that was like, so Jim, what do you, what do you want the music to be like? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but um, yeah, no, I am heavily involved in it. I, but it's like j just, j I suppose, like with the collaborators that you choose to work with, like some people, like someone like Andy is a very untraditional um, musician and composer and very in instinctive. He's not going to respond to a, to a, even like the most specific brief with anything that you would expect. So like, um, I mean, I remember like when we were really coming down to the wire with the mix for the film, and we had to get it off to Sundance, and and we were still trying to uh, compose like a couple of last bits of music, and <clears throat> there were a couple of cues that Andy hadn't quite nailed, and we we needed the music for, and he was like, "Okay, I'll I'll go off tonight." We were in LA, and he said, "I'll come back in the morning," and and then he came back in the morning and said, "Oh, I've written this piece of music. It's like." Uh, I really, yeah, have listened to this, I really love it. And then he played this sort of four minute dance track, which was with him sort of rapping over the top of it. And it was like, it just had nothing to do with the film or anything. And I was just feeling so frustrated. But then we ended up using the music in the, like the, not the vocals, but the music in the film when Rodney goes to see The Elegant Woman. It was like, like it suddenly occurred to me, oh, she could have like this kind of like pumping sort of club soundtrack in her room and, you know, and it was fucking great you know? yeah. but that's the kind of that's the process is like and then Andy will just come up with something that just feels absolutely 
brilliant. Like the first music in the film when you cut to the Aubrey's on the bed and then he goes to the coffee shop and it's just like, it's just got so much power, you know? And uh, uh, that's, that's what's exciting about working with people who just think in unpredictable ways. No, I think that's great. Sorry, we've got to wrap it up because we got other interviews. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, you're uh, going to regret that because I this know, is this actually, is, sure this, is, this is happening. Well, I have, I have one, more, one more question. Fun, what, we'll run real quick one day. Is that okay? Yes. Is, okay, quick. It up. Quick. Um, obviously, you're huge fans of cinema. Uh, what uh, would be your favorite scene from a film that's always stuck with you? Oh man, God, so many. Uh, well, I mean, the first one that comes to mind, I suppose, is quite obvious, but um, is Lost Highway. That you know, when the, when Robert Blake is saying, "I'm in your house right now, call me." I mean, David Lynch is huge, uh, but yeah, I mean, it could be Annie Hall where the lobsters are on the floor. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's just so many. Yeah, one that pops in my mind is when at the end of the film with Nail and I, when when uh, Richard E. Grant walks, takes a walk, and does a little oh, yeah, Shakespearean yeah. piece of, I think it's Hamlet. Um, yeah, with the umbrella. With yeah. umbrella, it's non-stop yeah. moments. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to choose one. I mean, Monty's eye makeup is a massive oh, okay. inspiration. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. So thank much. you.